But I did want to ask you, if you were to go back in time, would you have gone back to MIT? Or let me ask you this, John, was there like another university that you were about, almost about to go to, you're conflicted? You're like, is it MIT or is it X? So I'm not going to name the other one. Okay. I don't want to throw shade. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not about that, you know. Um, my father, after I got into MIT, really wanted me to go to, really wanted me to apply to Harvard. Mm -hmm. Not that I would get in and go, uh, but just so he could say that my son turned down Harvard because uh, he really wanted to do that. Unfortunately, they rejected me because mm -hmm. I was a little bit of a jerk during the application process. So I think I learned that one. No, I think I would go to MIT again. I don't think there was another school that was seriously in the running for a second. I, 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 I liked the idea of MIT since I was a kid because I liked how nerdy it was. I liked how unique it was. I'm actually really saddened because I think the university is changing its ethos in a couple of ways on these fronts. Um, and it's, and, and it's kind of scary to me. But no, I, I, I think for me, I, I, I was pretty hell bent on MIT from an early age. Well, let me ask you this. This is jumping a little bit ahead, but I, I, you just kind of inspired me. So for a founder now of your own company that's growing fast, um, do you feel a level of affinity or excitement when you see people coming out of MIT? You're like, oh my God, he's another MIT grad like me. Uh, do degrees and schools and caliber academic institutions matter to you? Or are you all about, are there more important attributes um, than, than you know whatever college you went to? So like, what what is your perspective on that? So... I, I love your question on this. I spent a lot of time recruiting. I probably spent half my life recruiting. Um, our criterion is that someone has to have accomplished something, <laughs> right? So if you apply to our company and we're looking at your resume, the goal is you need to accomplish something. That accomplishment can be broad. So for instance, getting a job at Google is 100% accomplishing something, right? Like, yes, it's not the end all be all, but it definitely takes some brains and wits to do it, right? Getting a, getting into MIT definitely takes something. Going into grad school at an incredibly good place definitely takes something. Starting a company or having a GitHub repository where you create some open source repo that like is very successful definitely takes something. So no, I don't think that I have a particular love for people who came from MIT or kind of a particular bias of that. I do think people at MIT are good at sussing out. Let's, uh, I don't want to use French here. So let's just say they're good at sussing out uh, non-legitimate statements, or they're good at cutting to the heart of matters, right? So one of the things that I really respect about the community is they kind of know what questions to ask to really kind of hit the nerve really quickly. Nice. Uh, and I think that that's a really good skill. I think that's an incredible skill because uh, I think a lot of life is filled with fluff. Nice. Um, so anyways, I, I would say that. So I, I get excited in the sense of like, I think I have a better idea over how that person, I have a better mental model over how to communicate with that person. And I have a shared vernacular with them, but I wouldn't say that I have a particularly massive bias one mm. way or the other. It's good to know. As long as, like you said, you put it aptly, like if, as long as you accomplish something, uh, it doesn't matter where you went to college, as long as it's something that, you know, they can be proud to talk about and, and something that you and the team can obviously be impressed about, then it's perhaps worthy of conversation. Yeah, hundred percent, because I think mm. the reality, so it's funny because I have thought about this. I've actually, we've hired more people from my high school than we have from my college that I went to. And I went to school at a random high school, in middle Missouri. And you might think about that for a minute and be like, John, that's pretty crazy, what the hell? But it actually I think makes a lot of sense because the reality is that MIT teaches people to be incredibly brilliant, mm -hmm. but not necessarily to do whatever needs to get done to get the job done, right? The reality is a startup's a lot of unsexy work. I spent most of my morning today like talking to banks or like changing statements or like changing settings on different password applications, right? A lot of a startup is a very unsexy work and it's very unappealing work. Uh, and so I think that you need to kind of have a certain level of grit and a certain level of like, I need to still make it. Like I, I, I'm not there yet, right? I haven't succeeded to where I want to. Um, and so I think there's actually almost a negative bias over really mm -hmm. great universities because they almost disincentivize people from that attitude, mm -hmm. right? Like we have an interview during our process where we call it the project management interview, which is effectively doing random things with people. It's like going on Wikipedia scavenger hunts, like start at pair and see how many words it takes you to get to like Barack Obama, right? Or go and see how quickly you can make like a Google Sheets and import a bunch of data and generate a bunch of graphs and do a bunch of things. Right. The reality is that 90% of life is just doing random tasks and your B is B ability to do those things competently, effectively, and quickly, I actually think that's like the single largest predictor of success. Mm. Um, 
So anyways, that's 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 what I think I would say on it. We're like, I think MIT is an amazing bar because if you've done that, then it's unquestionably obvious that you have a certain level of talent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reality is talent's everywhere. And I would imagine you see that particularly in the recruiting world a lot. Like, I mean, just statistically speaking, you probably place people more from outside of top tier universities than inside of top tier universities, right? We do. And I, and actually, I think that's a great, uh, great fact that it's happening like that, right? And so pe people understand that there's a lot more to a person than what, what college you go to. Naturally, like, you know, as, as you talked about, certain types of colleges, whether it's like the recruiting or filtering the qualification or maybe some sort, of, some sort of bias or something in common that they have together, like that's totally something that I think uh, people should be aware of. But I think on the whole, yes, I, I think, uh, especially in our industry, depending on the type of positions they're recruiting for, um, there are certain other levers that are, you know, as important or even more important than obviously your academic background. Um, how do you feel about engineers today with like a proper official CS degree versus those that kind of like you got into the field untraditionally, or they're either self-taught or whether through boot camp or some other means? Um, do you think one is better than the other or or not like it's just a very dynamic conversation in our field and for someone that like yourself is still coding to to this day and obviously you did you probably honed a lot of development skills at college and, and beyond but uh you know someone that literally picked up a book and then taught yourself i mean I, I think that's incredible so do you naturally connect and you're more empathetic to those that follow that same pathway um or again is it just does it go back to it's not about the school it's not about the degree it's about what you've accomplished from you know um when you started Creole to now? Yeah, I think you have a great question, Preston. So I struggle with this really hard because on one level, you know, as I was kind of mentioning before, I think the most important attribute that we look for when we hire people is their their shipping ability, right? Mm -hmm. Like, have they shipped something? So show me something you've shipped, whether that be a program, whether that be, I don't care, building something in your backyard, right? Show me something that you really designed, lived, breathed, and executed and built and shipped into the real world. The other side of that is the reality is that like, it's easy to write code. It's hard to write sustainable code, right? Uh, you know, like what the old stat, the engineers at Google write about seven lines of code a day. Um, I learned that firsthand because one of the first projects I ever worked on, it was a kind of a startup that I was trying to do called Fway Finance. And we built this system for executing financial transactions and it was tens of thousands of lines. I think it was like 60,000 or 70,000 lines or something like that. It was pretty massive. And I wrote it all myself. So I was like pretty smart. And like, you know, I could like write it all. But I think I spent more time fixing bugs. And it would take me like 14 days to add a new feature to it mm -hmm. uh, than doing anything. Because because I didn't know that you were supposed to write tests. I, I didn't even know those were a thing. Uh, and I didn't really understand the documentation was a mm -hmm. thing. I didn't know that you were supposed to name your variables things other than data. So mm -hmm. every variable was named data. And I didn't know that there was a difference between camel case and snake case. So I kind of just used whatever the hell I felt like in that line. Point is that I think there is an art and a skill to writing sustainable code. So to me, I think the best trade-off is the following. I think you want someone who knows how to write legitimate, real, scalable code. So the honest answer there is I don't think you learn that at university. I think you got to learn that on a job. Like I think you got to do that somewhere. And if you don't do that, then that's totally fine. But just be knowledgeable that the first six months, wherever you go, you're going to be spending time just learning how to write good code. Then I think beyond that, I don't think any of actual algorithms matter. I think it's just how you ship. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the other analogy I use is I'm an electrical engineer, right? I got a degree in electrical engineering from MIT. I never soldered at any point during my college experience. I never soldered. I never learned how to make a PCB. I never learned how to make a circuit. I didn't do any of that. Turns out you can get an entire degree in electrical engineering without doing any of that. Now, how that's possible, I don't know. But I do know that the reality is that what you get a degree in and this idea of formal schooling doesn't exist. So whether you're learning it on a job or learning because of your own devices, uh, I think you're learning those skills in a multitude of ways. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, that was a little bit of a long answer. But I, I, I think what I would say is, Writing sustainable code is hard and it's not nearly as fun as hacking. Hacking is super fun. Writing sustainable code sucks. So I think if you're a developer and like you want to, you know, go into someplace, I think you really need to realize that your first six months of having to program at some occupation is just going to show you that it's very different than programming by yourself. Because, right, like it's not as free, right? Like 
you actually have to watch your documentation. You have to mm-hmm. communicate with other people. You have to do all these things. And, and it's just like not that fun. Uh, the other way that I recommend people is if you just start a company and then get a big team and then your engineers kick you out of the code base, uh, <laughs> then you can just work on whatever the heck you want. Uh, and that's a really great system. So if you want, you can go that route. I love it. I love it. Now, I want to switch a little gears here. And and uh, you did mention that the early days of, of your company, you guys started uh, or you were able to kind of accelerate your, your start at an accelerator. Uh, how important was um, the accelerator to the early days of floating point group success. Uh, would you, if you had gone in time, would you have, you think you guys would still get to where you are today without the accelerator? I know it really some accelerators fast track you with the right relationships, the right investors and, and, uh, the, the, all the, the critical necessary, necessary kind of resources that'd be super helpful for companies and teams in the early days. So for those that are just unfamiliar who are listening right now, who are unfamiliar with incubators and accelerators, whether it's a private one or through universities, we'd just love to kind of hear a little bit about your experience there and how you thought maybe it was super helpful for you guys. Yeah. So have a little bit of a unique experience on this because we were invited to be a part of several accelerators. Mm. Um, and so we, we've definitely looked at a lot of them. I think accelerators are very powerful in the early days because it shows that you're pretty serious about what you're doing, right? Like uh, I I have a criterion for investing in companies, right? Because I'll I'll angel invest in some small companies. Uh, I do not write big checks. Let's be very clear. Like 10K is my like largest check I've ever written. And typically the very first criterion is, are all the founders full time? Mm -hmm. Because if the answer to that's no, then it's pretty much like, okay, you have a project, not a startup, right? Uh, the minute that you all go full time, that's somewhat starting to be a real company, right? Like regardless of whether or not you ever, you know, hire people or expand or grow anymore, if there are a couple of people and they are sustaining themselves, whether that be from their own savings or whatever, that's genuinely a startup in my book. I think an accelerator is powerful because it gets you in that mindset, gets you in that model immediately and does it in a very gentle way that I think a lot of people can go through. I think going cold turkey, quitting your job and starting something is a little bit of a scary prospect for a lot of people and for good reason. And I think you're exactly right that the connections are the second part. It's really hard to establish yourself in a new space and get to know people, right? When we first started in finance, very first thing we did, we looked at every alumni of our fraternity that lives in New York and works in finance and we emailed them and just asked, can we have a meeting? Like, are you willing to hang out with us and talk to us about what you do? Uh, and the accelerator kind of multi- multiplied our network beyond that. Mm-hmm. So I guess I'd say accelerators, you 100% don't have to do one. Functionally speaking, they probably hurt us more than they helped us. Like the reality of starting a business is building a product, giving it to a client and making money from that. Startups don't really optimize for that. They ask you, what are the long-term differentiation advantages? Or what is your long-term business model? Or what is the TAM? Those questions are irrelevant when you're trying to get started. You're trying, trying to get a dollar from someone. The most successful startup I've ever started, I did a couple weekends ago where we went and stood in lines outside restaurants and sold our spot in line waiting for people, right? That's like an amazingly scalable idea that you can do immediately. An accelerator, like you will go for six weeks without making a dime. And I really doubt that you've learned anything about business, but I do think it's important for setting that precedent and giving you some of these industry connections. Mm. Did you guys get a little stipend just to kind of support yourself? Because I know a lot of accelerator programs are, they, they run like 90, 120 days, right? We did. So ours was a little different. Uh, so ours was put on by the school. So it was non-dilutive. Mm. Uh, so we received uh, six grand personally for the summer. And then we received 20 grand for the entire company. Uh, so we didn't get much money. We effectively put it all in a big bank account, got mm. a three bedroom apartment, rented out the third room and lived in the other two. Uh, and we had that subsist on us until, yeah, that plus savings until we could like finally find investors plus a customer. I love that. I mean, thank you for sharing. I, I think it's very easy to, for a lot of people who wish to be a founder one of these days, or they just, you know, all they know about startups and technology are the movies or TV shows or the, you know, the crunch base of business insider articles that are just glorifying uh, the lifestyles of founders. But in the early days, it's difficult. You you have no idea if your company will succeed and you just have to be scrappy and lean and do exactly what you just talked about. Get a three bedroom apartment, rent out one and just be scrappy and lean and just work really, really hard. And I think it just, it just goes back to kind of what you shared before and how you're just very pragmatic. You're able to put your head down and put in the work. And I think um, the other co-founders are able to do that too, which is how you guys are where you are today. Um, so, so I think that's really cool. 
What are your personal thoughts as to the future of just blockchain and Web3 and crypto? I think any technological innovation innovates two things. Mm -hmm. I think it provides new technology and new ways of doing things. And I think it provides new ways for society to think about things, mm -hmm. right? I really wish I could think of a good example of this, but I can't think of a good example for this. Is say la vie, so I'll just use crypto. Crypto generated a really cool technology that can really transform the way we live. The idea that we no longer need a central intermediary to back every transaction that I send to you or that you send to you know whoever, that's a really beautiful thought. And that's a really beautiful system. And the idea that we can create this kind of universe of this computing power that you can purchase and decentralize kind of use and decentralize access to that, that's that's really amazing, right? That that's really a, a step forward for humanity. Unfortunately, though, I I, I don't think any of that will be used uh, because I think the reality is that. Crypto offers a pretty bleak future for the for, for the world because it's very Orwellian, right? The reality is that the government right now, if I give you 20 bucks and I pay you, I'm like, ah, Preston, thank you so much for letting me on that podcast. Here's the hundred bucks I owe you. Um, hypothetical, you know, I, 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 but anyway, uh, if I did that, right, like the government wouldn't technically know. Mm -hmm. But yet if I send you a hundred dollars of Bitcoin and the government insert all their monitoring here that they want to do, they're a hundred percent going to be able to see that and know that, right? So I actually think crypto is really, really, really bad for personal privacy and personal liberties. And as a strong libertarian, I am saddened by that. And I'm very nervous about that. I'm also nervous about this idea of decentralized computing being used at large scale, because I think you're seeing more and more large conglomerates, like economies of scale are pretty much always going to win out, right? Like proof of stake versus proof of work can be pretty much summarized by the statement of like, it never made sense for people to be mining in their basements because they didn't have economies of scale. So then they moved to working out of these massive data warehouses. Mm -hmm. And then people were spending massive amounts of money in order to do all these things, right? And so the reality is, I think crypto will take over the back end of the world. I think when JP Morgan wants to send money from here to Korea, they're going to use crypto. Mm -hmm. And I think when you go and buy a house, your deed is going to be on the blockchain. I don't think title insurance is going to exist. That industry is insane. Every time you buy a house, someone has to write down who now owns the house. And if they write it down wrong, you have to buy insurance for that because sometimes they write it down wrong. And I think that's insane. And I think that should be NFT. And so, and I think all stocks will be tokenized and put on the blockchain. I think all voting will be done the same way governance is done in crypto. So I think on the back end, crypto is amazing. And I think it's going to change the world. And I think it's going to make it a lot better. But I don't think it's going to change society. And I think it's because of that that I'm so pessimistic and saddened by it. So for those that are deep into Bitcoin and are hodling and are hoping that the crypto winters are over, are you thinking that there's the crypto blizzard right around the corner or they might have to go and... Uh, put on another kind of snow jacket to, to stay warm for years you know, to come. I think Bitcoin, yeah, I, I, there's definitely going to be more winters. <laughs> I think today even crypto dropped by about 10 or 12%. But mm -hmm. Granted, everything did because of CPI. I think cryptos will continue to exist in their current state. I think the major cryptos, like insert top 10 here, uh, I think those will probably retain their value because they're just going to be seen as investing assets. Mm -hmm. I think most other things are going to depreciate at some point pretty mm -hmm. heavily. Um, and I think eventually they're going to have to find their uses. I just don't think they've found them yet. Yeah. Um, but they're working on that. I think there's a couple of exciting projects. I think Avalanche is pretty exciting. I think Hashgraph is pretty exciting. And Hedera is very exciting, I think. Uh, and then I also think that Algorand is pretty exciting with a lot of their zero computing stuff. Um, and I think a lot of the ApeCoin stuff is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a couple of blockchains that I'm pretty excited about. But I think vast majority, like, yeah, it's pretty scary yeah. For someone who aspires to be, to follow in your footsteps one of these days, whether it means like have a successful career, whether it means like creating and becoming a founder one of these days of a, of a tech company, what is like one advice that you want to give to those that are listening? Live your life as a series of stories. Just find the most interesting things and go for them and do them because chances are those are the things that, yeah, will end up being most fun and change the way you see the world. I love it. I mean, life is a combination of stories and chapters. And you were able to just clearly demonstrate that with your life from Missouri to MIT to going from physics to electrical engineering to development and then to crypto to trading. And now you're you're a founder in New York City. Um, and well, so it is exciting to see what you and your team will do moving forward. It's it's exciting to see. I think for someone with a breadth of your background and your experiences, John. 
Uh, perhaps it'd also be exciting to see 10, 20 years down the line, maybe what you also has in store for you, perhaps after a floating point group with someone who so many interests and skills um, and ones that are just very unique, others that are just very tangential. But, you know, I think I definitely uh, am grateful for you taking the time and sharing your experience. I certainly have learned a lot and I'm sure people who are listening have learned a lot too. And if you are listening, make sure uh, you check them out. You can feel free to reach out to John. Um, and if you are somehow um, vibing with all this and you're excited and you want to work with the team one day, feel free to also reach out to them as well. But uh, John, I just want to thank you again. It's been, it's been fun. And for someone who has not that many experiences on podcasts. I think you should be a regular now. Like you're, you're just a natural. <laughs> this is great. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Preston. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it. And have a lovely rest of the day. You got it. We'll keep in touch. Bye.